we have kind of just had to make our own decisions and um, realize that you can't change people. I have grown up on TV and my journey, our journey, has been a difficult one and one that I kind of grew into a new world um, where Derek and I were making decisions for our own family and it was proving pretty challenging for us. And so for a while I didn't want to write a book about it because it was so hard to write about and I love my family so much I wanted to take it very seriously and um, so, but when we finally decided to write the book, I felt like it was very important because I wanted to be a voice for other people who might be walking through similar situations, even though they might have not grown up on reality TV. Um, everybody faces challenges and adulting and all of the things, difficult relationships that you're having to navigate, learning to make healthy boundaries. Um, so I feel like this book was very important for us, um, especially for me to use my voice and my platform that I've been given um, to write about our story and hopefully help others find their voice or people who have found their voice to realize like they're not alone, um, to not feel isolated because I think when you feel isolated then you can oftentimes be a target for control and manipulation. I think just overall the overall misconception is that people think you know they know your life story i think us getting to tell our lives and about our lives and what things might be behind closed doors like happening just with not just for the sake of exposing but where people might have had like an illustration of something or said like this teaching that I grew up in. For, for example, like the group that I grew up in has been the talk recently about like the religious beliefs that, that my parents um, raised us in. And people might say, oh, well, you know, everybody makes mistakes or whatever. Um, and so you should just like overlook that. But at the same time, I feel like whenever people are embracing those mistakes, and when my parents or other people like continue to talk about that and um, advocate for those things, then it makes me feel like I need to speak about it. I definitely do worry about um, my other family members and other people who are following the IBLP teachings um, and their cult-like practices. Um, I just feel like it if you're not careful and you don't take a wider perspective and really look at everything that they're teaching, um, it's easy to think like, oh, well, we remove one person and it puts a new face on the organization or the teachings. Um, but it's really, if you delve into it, it's the same core teachings of that foster that control and um, sometimes abuse, unfortunately. So having a lot of kids is definitely part of the group that I grew up in, like their belief system. So I knew a lot of families with a lot of kids that homeschooled and believed that birth control was not okay. Um, so yeah, it, it wasn't just for TV that they were doing that. Now I think that- It might other, have added to it. Yeah, it might have added to it or like there were other aspects that definitely contributed to the way that my parents um, to the way that my parents lived, but um, overall having 19 kids, um, I don't think that that was like entirely made up. Who in either of your families has read this book? I don't believe anybody Nobody in our family's read it. Yeah. So, yeah. How would you describe your relationship with your parents now? When was the last time that you spoke with them? Yeah, so I saw my mom uh, at a birthday celebration for one of my sisters. And she's always good about like bringing birthday gifts over, um, Christmas gifts, things like that. But it is very complicated. So um, with my dad, we mostly see him at weddings, funerals, and then sometimes a few other events here and there. Um, but yeah, it's complicated. And we try to not involve my mom in too much of it. Um, <clears throat> we really don't have a whole lot of conversations at this point in our relationship with my family about the whole family drama situation because we feel like we have kind of just had to make our own decisions and um, realize that you can't change people. Um, they have to like make those decisions for themselves, which is hard sometimes. So uh, yeah, we try to just, you know, 
when there's a moment that we can spend together and have family time and it's healthy for us or we're in a good place, we try to do that. And then other times I feel like I'm just not there and not able to do that. So we have to like draw that boundary. One thing that helped us was something our therapist taught us, which was it's okay. Uh, you have to be okay with other people not being okay. So I think we had to get to that point where we're not going to convince other people. You know, we can't change other people. We just have to be okay with that. Have you been in contact with Josh's wife, Anna, at all? We have not been in contact with Anna. I have seen her at a few occasion, on a few occasions, um, but I also want to respect, I know she's asked for some space, so we want to respect that as well. I think when you are learning to set boundaries in your own life, you also learn to respect other people's boundaries. So I, I cannot imagine all that she's going through, and I just want to yeah. also give her that space. What is it do you think keeps her with Josh? Yeah, I have no idea why Anna has decided to stay with Josh and like what she is dealing with there and everything. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea and I'm just, I guess, watching with everybody else kind of just what unfolds there. I just, it seems like yesterday she was little and now here she's all grown up. I grew up on TV and was pretty young whenever it started, and there weren't a whole lot of safeguards in place for kids in television. Um, so whether it be like working a lot of hours and um, that kind of taking over your education or whatever it might be, like there weren't a whole lot of safeguards in place for us. Um, and I imagine not for other kids too, probably. I think reality TV became too much, at least for us in our story, whenever we had a separate identity from Jill's family. Because it's easy whenever the whole family kind of has the same schedule, there's one person making decisions for everybody. Not that that's always good because that doesn't mean you can't be taken advantage of, but whenever you're living your own life and there's somebody else making decisions for you and you don't have the information and the ability to make decisions, it becomes problematic. I definitely think in the day-to-day -day with the show, there were pressures to um, do things for the show. Like, for example, like the schedule that they planned, um, certain events. You can't just film everybody sitting around the table, eating breakfast, and then doing school and eating lunch, and like all of the day-to-day -day things. So they definitely had to create content and be creative with that. Um, I know in our relationship, yeah. even from the very beginning, the show was a very was very much a part of it, just because Jill even told me and her dad made it apparent to her and uh, she told me later that if it weren't for the show she wouldn't be allowed to come visit me even in Nepal. It's like well we're gonna film yeah. it or you're not going at all. Yeah. Even like in our wedding like I think some of the early red flags were um, we wanted to utilize an app that allowed our friends to take pictures and upload them and us to get to experience our special day um, when we couldn't necessarily see and talk to every single person as much as we would like to um, which we advocated a lot for and because of the show we couldn't do that and uh, at our wedding they said you know for the sake of the bride and groom we asked that you not take uh, photos and it was hard for me especially maybe uh, not as much for Jill because we were at different places at that point but we wanted so much to say or at least I did no it's not for the sake of the bride and groom it's for the sake of the show like I could care Jill and I both at that point could care less if people took pictures it's because of the show I love you. I love you. So we talk about in the book how we did the show voluntarily and how we were made to believe that our payment should just be, at the time, initially, like volunteer and we should, we would get perks. So like, you know, if they're grocery shopping while they're filming, they would cover that, travel. Um, and then my dad had several like handouts that he would give us. But we were also under the impression that for a long time we would just, we could call it quits whenever we wanted. Um, and just kind of like when it got to be too much, we were trying to like help my parents out, keep it going. And, and again, like we weren't stupid. We, we, we realized that we weren't getting compensation, but at the same time, like Joel said, we were just trying to help out the family. And we didn't think that we had any obligations. So it wasn't until there was a conflict and we were going one direction in our life and I was in conflict with the show that we realized that there were contractual obligations for Jill that her parents had made for her. And we wouldn't, I think had we had better boundaries at the start of our marriage and the start of our relationship, we would have called it quits with the show a lot earlier. But for the sake of like the religious 
upbringing that I had where we really did believe like you have to obey and honor your parents and this whole like umbrella of authority thing that they taught where it's like God and then your parents and then you and it's like forever so like you have to get their blessing to do something it just created this control level where I was conditioned to think like unless basically unless my parents could like release us somehow even from filming we couldn't stop so if they weren't okay with it which at the time like I was the first Duggar daughter to get married and we were having grandbabies and like there were lots of high points that we were not okay to stop doing what we were doing to contribute. So it was like this, this weird at, at <laughs> dilemma. The, at the same time, I think the biggest thing was not having any opportunity to be a part of those discussions and decide what we wanted to be a part of, what we didn't. Um, and make our own decision because, exactly. again, it was so much about the control. If we had been a part of those discussions, it wasn't necessarily that we would not have done it at all. It's that we would have put things in place that would have been beneficial for our family, like being able to reevaluate every year, um, being able to just leave when we were going to go take a job that conflicted with filming, um, and we weren't a part of those discussions. Yeah, we didn't have any and, ability. And it wasn't until we realized that those decisions had been made without us that we um, realized that there was opportunity cost and if there's opportunity cost then I feel like we should get it compensated for something uh, for giving up something so that's when we started down that road and we were told you'll be paid whenever um, we pass away someday and that'll be a part of your inheritance is what you contributed to the show. Derek and I are in Central America right now as missionaries. I talk about it in the book where we um, are living in Central America and it was to the point where we were kind of like, we cannot keep up with this full-time filming and trying to pursue our lives as missionaries on the mission field full-time. And they were requesting that we come back to the States for a promotional shoot. And so we were kind of putting our foot down and like, no, this is not a surprise. Like we told you we were gonna be gone for this term and now everybody's like oh my goodness like you're gonna be gone for this time this amount of time and we're like no like you knew this like why is it a shock now and um anyway and so they were all like playing nice at first but then whenever we put our foot down and we're like we're not coming back we can't come back for this um and kind of drew a line in the sand that's when we found out that there was like contract that they let us know about and said, no, you're obligated, you have to come back. And that was the first time we'd ever heard about it. Um, and then subsequently we received a photo of a signature page that I had signed the day before our wedding. And then it starts unraveling at that point and we're like, oh my goodness. Like I remember the moment then where I had signed, at first I'm like, it's gotta be forged. Like I have no idea. And then I saw the, the signature line and realized that this was the document, just the signature page that I had seen. I was made to believe that it was something else. And then... She didn't have access to the contract, just the yeah. signature page. So, and I, I had taken off the day of work and I wasn't with her whenever she was made to sign this signature page. So it's hard to believe after the fact that it was an innocent um, oversight whenever in any other situation with something this big, especially in this culture, her parents would have encouraged her to talk to her husband that she's gonna marry the next day about whether or not this is something you wanna to commit to for the next five years. And I wasn't even present. I must have been in the bathroom or something, I don't know. Yeah, so it was, it was really, really hard for me to swallow and still like trying to process that and think like, surely not, like surely there's something, but the more adamant that they, be, that they became about, no, you're obligated to this, the more I started to believe, wait, like, maybe I really was like duped into this or like somehow it can't just be like a simple mistake. Especially, um, I think it was interesting whenever we asked about the contract um, and what it was that Jill had signed that she wasn't allowed to see it. Um, yeah. Which was strange. Usually if you sign something, someone's really quick to show you what you signed and they're like, no, we're not gonna show you that contract. And it was still years after learning about the contract that we even saw the contract. The full thing. The yeah, they sent us like bits and pieces. Bullet but, points, yeah. Yeah, what they wanted us to know. At one point in the book, we talk about where my dad gave us 
$80,000 in compensation. And we were like puzzled at first, like, what is this for? We also were in this weird position where we didn't want to ask too many questions um, because they were being, like, everything was being tightly controlled and shut down, conversations were being shut down. So, um, but we also knew we were not going to sign anything additional as, to receive that. And as far as whether or not it was fair, it was for sure not fair because it was very, yeah. it was a unilateral, take it or leave it. There's no discussion. Um, but it wasn't a matter of what was fair. And even after that, it was more about principle and what people were really willing to recognize. It was never about what it's worth to us, but I was just curious uh, because so much of it was about control. And I just want him to recognize that there's value being added to it because of what we're doing. Um, it wasn't it seemed ever, like a one way street most of the yes. time. Like, well, I've done this or I've done that. It was so much about, um, about? something I'm something that he's doing for us. Like I'm blessing you guys with this amount of money. And it wasn't ever about compensation or thank you've you for adding it. value or you've earned it. It was like, we want to help out each of our kids. So this is something we want to do for each of you guys. So it was never about what was fair or not. Yeah, there are a lot of critics who will say like, oh, but look at all you got from the show or look at all the perks you had for being on the TV show. And um, to them, I would say you can, just because your situation is not as bad as the next person does not invalidate where you are. And I think that's, that's for anybody's story. Like just because your abuse or just because your hardships are not as bad as the next person doesn't mean that you're not being harmed or that there's not a problem that you're facing that you need help with. Um, so, and then I would say too, that there can be positives and negatives and they can both coexist very well. So like I point out in the book, like there are a lot of happy memories. I love my family. I love a lot of the memories that we've had together. Does that make it right over here that like all these negative things have happened? No. Um, so I, I compare it a lot to roses and thorns where there are beautiful moments, they're like roses, and then there are thorns. And it doesn't have to be completely one way or another. Like they, they can coexist and the highs should not automatically be erased by the lows, but also like vice Gosh. versa. Will we ever see you two on TV again? <laughs> not real, I mean, we're doing an interview right now, <laughs> but like probably not like reality TV and stuff. I don't know, it's just. Yeah, and one thing me. is that <laughs> like, we haven't been like <laughs> against TV, it's just against the control, against being able to make decisions and um, that's the biggest thing for us. For sure that. I mean, but I also want to, growing up on reality TV, I would want to protect our kids and not not decide their lives for them. And I feel like that's also something that people, parents, our generation are facing. Everybody is like, how much or how little do you involve your kids on social media? You know, like that's like a huge thing. I think there are public figures whose kids you know nothing about. Um, there's a lot of uh, protection. But then there's others where it's just like, they're relying so much on their kids. If it weren't for their kids, then the whole business plan falls out. And I think that's the, da I mean, that's the dangerous part about it is um, it got to that point with the show, like after a certain point, so much was about the adult kids' relationships, their marriages and births, that if you had adult kids who chose not to do that, or your own kids who didn't want to be a part of that. You wouldn't um, have a show. You wouldn't have a show. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to, not set up your life in a way that depends on your kids. Like, if if it uh, touches on that at some point, like that's one thing. But if it depends on them and you're uh, using them, uh, then, then that's it where it's dangerous. Then it can evolve into yeah the danger. I do. I think the main thing that keeps our love so strong is just the decision um, that we made on our wedding day um, and the vows that we kept and that God was at the center of our relationship. And there are days that you don't feel the same. From every day you're gonna feel different, but it's just a choice. Like I think just choosing to um, give 100% uh, each other to the other one. Yeah, and I think like whenever we were facing some of these challenges <clears throat> where it got really intense and we would be fighting about something, we had to decide, like there were like moments where I woke up and was like, I'm gonna have to decide where I was put between a rock and a hard place. You know, it's like, do I choose my family or do I choose my husband? And I think a lot of people probably get put in that place um, just in life where it's, uh, 
difficult decisions, whether it's boundaries or whatever. And uh, I was I was wanting to go in line with like what where we were feeling directed and called, but there was so much pressure from family to go a different route. And then you add like the TV show on top of that, and it created a mess. And like the teachings that we were under at the time as well, like the religious um, ideas where you had to really fall in line with your parents forever, kind of. Um, the whole honor your father and mother thing taken as like an obedience, um, even into adulthood, was very um, problematic and carried into our lives. Something that was really helpful in our parenting now, where we're at, we, we realize nobody's perfect and stuff, but we went to a parenting or a marriage class thing um, one time and they were talking about um, <clears throat> principles that anybody can really live by, but you kind of take what you've learned from your families um, and you can reject some things, you can uh, recycle some things, and what was the other one? You, you can accept other things. Accept other things. Speaking so, of your families of origin, like yeah. you're going to have your new identity as your new family, but you come from two separate families of origin, so you're going to accept some things, reject other things, and recycle some things. Yeah, so it's really beautiful to like take what you need and like revamp some things, and so that's what we hope to do with our boys is, you know, we have learned lots of positives from both of our families, and um, you know, investing quality time, like spending time with your kids, being intentional. Um, so yeah, we're on that journey ourselves. Something that we reject is just that we're gonna have their life planned out for them. Whether or not people would admit that, um, I don't think it's a coincidence that, um, I wanna be careful how I say it, but that you're kind of set up for like one way of life. Like if, you're, if your education is, if you're anemic with your education, like you're gonna be very limited. If you get to the point where you want to do something that requires an education, if you have to go back and take remedial classes and your family's not necessarily encouraging that path, then it's gonna take a lot more effort if you were to choose something like that versus preparing them for whatever it is that they choose, like getting them to a, a base level, um, for example, with their education so that they could go on to something that requires further education and not feel awkward about being behind if that's the case. I think Jill and Derek today are just a couple who love uh, Jesus Christ, who are trying, who love each other and are just trying to figure out their way in the world and raise their family the best that they can. We both have really seen um, our faith through this trial um, of our lives here. It kind of goes, like it wavers at times, but um, just we've, really sought God together and um, we've been through so much together. I mean, Derek losing his dad, um, all of those things that are really, really difficult times that we didn't feel like there was anything other than to seek Jesus in those moments. So I liked how my sister Ginger also talked about it, how she said like disentangling your faith. So kind of like sorting out what you believe and what things look like versus like what you've been taught and um, I felt like that was a really helpful illustration also in this whole thing, in this whole process. Has well, this process brought the two of you closer together? Yeah, it has. So Ginger and I definitely have gotten closer through this process. I, I was very happy to put in there what this book is not, and it's not like tr me trying to like change my family or as a part of the reconciliation process. Um, I'm not just bashing my family. I love my family. I think that's another reason why it's taken us so long to write this book. One, because we've been living our story, but two, also because I love my family and I really care about them and it just, it carried a lot of weight for me to be able to just even put these words into a book and I wanted to do it accurately and carefully. Um, so I know it isn't guaranteed to be well received, but um, yeah, I think we're playing the long game here and really just hoping for better relationships in the future and hopefully people will find encouragement in their own stories um, just by knowing they're not alone and helping them find their voice maybe.